Okay, so I'm going to continue where I left off the other day, uh, <clears throat> last Shabbat, because I really would like to get this message uh, out there and available for you to listen to. I think it's very timely and it's important. So just to kind of remind everyone, you know, we were making comparison between counting of the Omer, which count to 50, and the 50th day would be Shavuot, or uh, in the Greek would be Pentecost, count 50. And comparing that with also, this is a very special year. You see, we're on a Shabbat today, but we're also in a Shabbat year, the land rest year, the seventh year, uh, the Shemitah year, which is also a cycle of counting to 50. And so a lot of parallels going on there. And so in Leviticus 25, <clears throat> Leviticus 25, And I think I'll just read verse 24 here. Leviticus 25 and verse 24. And in all the land of your possession, you shall grant redemption of the land. So that's part of the land rest is that the land would be redeemed. The land would be bought back. In other words, it would be taken and given back to its owners to the ones whom God says, because God is the redeemer, whom God will redeem it and buy it back and give it to whomever he will. So that's part of the prophecy. And so, uh, indeed, it will be. Again, in Leviticus 26, then, just uh, another chapter over, Leviticus 26, and God's talking about blessings, laws for uh, obedience and the blessings that would result in the natural you know, hey, if I drop my pencil, it's going to hit the ground. That's called gravity. It's just an automatic thing. So automatic curses that come when we disobey God's uh, Torah and his instructions, his precepts, his ordinances, his statutes. Leviticus 26 and in verse 35, God says here, as long as it lies desolate, it shall rest, referring to the land, right? Okay, verse 34, the land shall enjoy its Sabbath as long as it lies desolate, because the people were not obeying God's laws. And so he said, I will lay your cities waste and I'll bring your land to desolation, verse 32, and I'll scatter you out all among the nations all around the world. And then the land will lie rest as long, and, and, and in verse 35, as long as it lies desolate, it will rest for the time it did not rest on your Shemitahs or on your Sabbaths when you dwelt in it. Again, then in 2 Chronicles 36, we see this uh, happening again. 2 Chronicles chapter 36. So that's God's judgment then, that the land would rest one way or the other, and not willingly, it will rest uh, against the will of the inhabitants, because God's word will stand. So now in 2 Chronicles chapter 36... 2 Chronicles chapter 36, and uh, again, I don't want to read the whole passage, so uh, I'll just read verse 21. It says, to fulfill the word of the eternal by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So 70 years they had not kept Shemitah, they had not kept the land rest, they had not forgiven the poor during their, in their land during the seventh year. They, didn't, they were not forgiving one another. They were not letting the land go back. They're still trying to cultivate the land and, and, and work the land and disregard God's laws. And so he said, okay, you did that for 70 years, so I'll put you into captivity for 70 years, and the land will rest 70 years, and it will make up for the lost time. And so this was God's instruction. Okay, so we started off, I was showing you the comparison between counting the Omer and counting the seven-year cycle. And I'm going to kind of speed it up here because I really want to try to get this, uh, this done for you today. And so then I asked the question, what happens when it's time for the land to revert back? And God says, okay, I'm going to give you some of your land back or maybe all of it or what have you. And those who are now the occupiers, because God said that he was going to take Israel, scatter them around the world. And what happens when he begins to give their land back to them? Well, the people who are there are like, uh, forget you. This is my land. I have a right to it. I've been here for a long time now. Well, yeah, it's true, because God's kicked us out a long time ago. But when God decides it's time to give it back, 
guess what? Oftentimes, Shemitahs end up with, hey, you didn't forgive people of their debt, and so there's massive financial calamity in a nation. Uh, land goes back to the owner, and the people that are there say, no, then that's war. So it ends up being a time of judgment, which is why God said, for 70 years you didn't do it, and so this is my judgment. The land will lie rest for 70 years. So Shemitah can be a time of judgment, and this is a Shemitah year. And so <clears throat> as we consider now, this is just considering, as we consider when the land does to begin to revert back, what if the people that are there now, the occupiers, of course, the things get so twisted that the people that it belongs to are actually called occupiers. <laughs> they call Israel the occupier. But, I mean, I'd say, you know, the, uh, without God, you know, black can be white and up can be down and et cetera. So, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> do we see in prophecy Israel going to war and recapturing their land before the return of Yeshua, Hamashiach? That's the question. So I just thought, while we're watching, because I'm making no predictions, you know, this isn't a prophecy, this is going to happen. You're not hearing me make any dates or saying any such thing like that. And anybody who says otherwise is just simply misconstruing what I'm saying, because I'm not saying that. I'm not giving you any predictions of any specificity at all. I'm saying to watch and consider. That's all. So as we watch and consider, do we see in the Word of God where Israel would begin to re regain some of their land before Messiah returns? Because people kind of sometimes get an idea in their head, well, once Messiah returns, then the whole world's going to change. And I'm talking about before Messiah returns. And that's important because if things begin to happen, maybe we'll understand. Because I don't think prophecy is necessarily always to... Uh, let us know what's going to happen in advance. It's, I think, more often so that when things do happen, we recognize what's going on if we are tuned into God's Word. It's so that when it does happen, you recognize it and you know. It's not so that you can predict the future because how many times do prophecies end up being fulfilled in a way other than what we thought it was going to be? Uh, like maybe most of the time, for example. So prophecy isn't to necessarily predict the future as much as it is to, and it does occasionally do that, I know, but mostly it's so that when you watch, you can understand, like it said in the book of Daniel, these prophecies are for the end time. You won't understand until the end time. Go your way, shut the books, it's sealed until the time of the end. And then it says knowledge will increase. So at the time of the end, when things begin to happen, there will be some that will have knowledge, that will have understanding, like it said in Issachar, the people of David had understanding of the times, the Spirit of God, to know what they should do. And God will guide each of you to know if you're tuned in and paying attention. And so that's what this message is about. It's about the, uh, wake up and, and look and listen. Study God's Word. Be alert. Okay, so I, I'd like to show you in God's word, where Israel will be in, at battle, battles which will result in their reclaiming their land prior to the return of Yeshua, prior to the coming of Mashiach. Okay? Whether you believe it's his first coming, you know, some Jews think he hasn't come yet, or, you know, as the Messianic community and as the Christian world uh, is waiting for the return, you know, of Yeshua or Jesus. Okay, so before the coming of Mashiach, let's look to begin again in Numbers chapter 24 and verse 16. And I'll scoot right along here. Numbers 24 and verse 16. <clears throat> I, I, I said 16 and I really meant to say verse 14. So I apologize. Let's go to verse 14. Numbers 24, verse 14. <clears throat> he says, And now, indeed, I'm going to my people. Come, and I will advise you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. So this is uh, <clears throat> Balak and Balaam getting together, trying to find out how they can curse uh, Israel, right? And Balaam wanted to curse Israel, 
and they were watching Israel as they were getting ready to, open, uh, to come into the promised land and inherit their inheritance. And so uh, Balaam is giving this prophecy under God's instruction. And it's not what Balak wanted to hear. Nonetheless, he says, well, come and I will advise you what this people, what, who are they? They were Israel. They're looking at him down in the plain. What this people, Israel, will do to your people in the latter days. The latter days would be the days that we are in or coming up very soon to them. He took up his oracle and he said, The utterance of Balaam the son of Beor and the utterance of the man whose eyes are opened, the utterance of him who hears the words of God and knows the knowledge of the Most High, who sees the vision of the Almighty, falls down with his eyes open wide, and I see him but not now. I behold him but not near. A star will come out of Jacob, a scepter will arise out of Israel and batter the brow of Moab. So we're talking about the Moabites. Okay, we're talking about Israel and the Moabites. And it says a sword is going to come out and batter the brow of Moab. Now, where, who are the Moabites today? Well, that would be Jordan, Ammon, the capital of Jordan, you know, and Jordan, maybe even some... Uh, Bedouin peoples, okay? Batter the brow of Moab and destroy the sons of destruction. And also, but that's not it. It says also, Edom shall be a possession. And Seir, that's, in other words, Edom, meaning the people, and Seir, Mount Seir is their location, okay? So there's a location in the Bible, Mount Seir, will fall to Israel. That's a very specific prophecy. Seir will be a possession. Edom will be a possession. His enemies shall be a possession. While Israel does valiantly. Unless somebody thinks, no, that's a messianic prophecy for Yeshua, the Messiah is going to do this. No, it, what does it say? While Israel does valiantly. That is what it says. Okay, so uh, then it goes on to talk about Amalek. So we shared this with you a little bit uh, a, a, again in the past. Let's go again now to Isaiah chapter 17. And uh, then I want to just kind of keep going forward here. Isaiah chapter 17. Just a, a short little prophecy, just something to consider. Uh, verse 1 here, the burden against Damascus. Well, we know where Damascus is. That's in Syria, okay? The Syria and Damascus is not a very stable place to be right now in the world. I think we understand that. The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city, and it will be a ruinous heap. This has never happened to Damascus before. This prophecy has never been fulfilled. Damascus has never ceased to be a city. As a matter of fact, I think they claim to be one of the oldest cities in the world. as a continuous, uninterrupted existence of a city. Damascus is one of the oldest cities. So it's going to cease to be a city. Well... <clears throat> the kingdom will cease from being uh, from Damascus. It says again in verse 3. So let's turn over a few more pages now. This is kind of where we left off last time, and so now we're getting back to it. Isaiah 34 and verse 1. Come, you, ne you nations. So all the nations, God says, hey, listen up. Heed, you people. Let the earth hear. You know, that doesn't happen very often where God actually speaks in a prophecy and he says, I don't want just, you know, one, I don't want just Israel to hear this or this is the burden against Damascus or this is the burden against Egypt or what have you. He says, come you nations, heed you people, let the earth hear. Everybody in the world, God wants to hear this. All and all that is in it. The world and all things that come from the world. Everyone listen up. Because this is not just for Israel. This is for the whole world to get. And I wish those who are trying to negotiate away uh, Israel's land for peace would get this. And, and they will when God's ready. 
the indignation of the eternal is against all nations, the whole world. That's in time tribulation. When does God ever take an action against the whole world? Well, he did it in the flood, Noation flood, and he's going to do it again at the return, of, uh, you know, in, at the tribulation period leading up to the return of Messiah. We know that. His fury is against all their army. He's utterly destroyed them and given them over to the slaughter. Their slain will be thrown out and the stench will rise from the corpse. The mountains are going to be melted with their blood. And all the host of heaven will be dissolved. So even that which is not pure or, or sinless in heaven is going to be dissolved. They are going to be cast out. You know, Satan is going to be cast out of heaven. Uh, demons are cast out. Even the heavens are going to be shaken. It talks about in a couple of different places. I shake heavens and the earth. This is what it's referred to, referring to here. The heavens will be rolled up like a scroll, and their hosts will fall down. It says, as the leaf falls from the vine, as the fruit fallen from a fig, for my sword will be bathed in heaven, and it will come down on Edom. There again, just like we read Back there in that prophecy in Numbers chapter 24, God says his sword is going to come down in judgment on Edom, on the people of my curse for judgment. It's time for them to be judged. The sword of the eternal is filled with blood and made overflowing with fatness, like oil, the fatness of the land, with the blood of lambs and goats, with the fat of kidneys and rams, for the eternal has a sacrifice in Basra. Basra is territory of Edom. So if you want to know where Edom is, one of the places where you'll find Edom today is in Basra. You can get a, a map, and Basra is still a city today. And you know right where it is, right there in Iraq. There's an, actually, I think, two Basras. One of them is in the south area of Jordan, both of which are Edomite and Moabite territory and is going, going, that is going to be uh, in this judgment. There's a sacrifice in Basra for the people of Edom. That's where they are. And a great slaughter in the land of Edom. Basra is in Edom's land. People wonder, oh, wonder where Edom is today. Well, here's where they are at the return of Messiah. And this is where they were anciently in the Bible. And back in the book of Genesis, this is where they were when King David was alive. And this is where they are today. A great slaughter in the land of Edom. Wild oxen will come down with them, and young bulls with the mighty bulls, and their land will be soaked with blood, and their dust saturated with fatness, because it is the day of the eternal's vengeance, the year of recompense. Why? Why all this recompense? Why is God coming down and judging the whole world? Remember, he said, all the nations, give ear, O earth. Why? For the cause of Zion? Really? God's going to judge the whole world for the cause of Zion? Are you serious? You really expect me to believe that? Yes, I do, because that's what God's Word says. And I think we do well to believe God's Word. That's what God thinks about Zion. So when somebody says, oh, those Zionists, and they say it with disdain, yeah, this is what God says for the cause of Zion. So, <clears throat> its streams will be turned into pitch and its dust into brimstone and its land become a burning pitch. Kind of like when you set oil wells off. A lot of oil wells over there to be set off so that the land would burn like pitch. So back to verse 7 though here. It says, the wild oxen will come down with them. And young bulls, the mighty bulls. Who are these wild oxen? And why would it suddenly be talking about some, some cattle, you know, in the middle of this prophecy? Why would it all of a sudden be talking about cattle? It's not talking about cattle. And I'm going to show you what these wild oxen are because that is part of the prophecy to understand. So let's see. Let's let the Bible interpret the Bible. And we're going to go back then to... Back where we were in Numbers again. Remember, I'll show you what this people will do to your people in the latter days. Numbers chapter 24. So let's go back to Numbers and let's find out who these oxen are that it's talking about. You know, because it was very specific. Young bulls, mighty bulls, and the wild, wild oxen. 
Okay, so this time, Numbers 24, we were in just a moment ago. Let's just back up because, you know, those prophecies started around, what, Numbers 21 or 22, and I just read the end of it. But let's go pick it up a little bit back in Numbers chapter 23 this time. Numbers 23. And verse, uh, let's pick it up here in verse 21. You know, again, you know, he, he took up his oracle and uh, Balaam, you know, he said, uh, I, I've received a command to bless and I cannot reverse it. Verse 20, verse 21, he has not observed lawlessness or iniquity in Jacob, nor has he seen wickedness in Israel. The eternal his God is with him, and the shout of a king is among them. God brings them out of Egypt. And what does God say about these people that he brought out of Egypt? He brings them out of Egypt, and he has strength like a wild ox. So Israel is likened unto a wild, having the strength of not just an ox. I hope you understand that every word of God has meaning. Not just an ox, but very clear a wild ox. And wild oxen do have more strength than domesticated ones. They are more wild, <laughs> that's for sure. Okay, so he has strength like a wild ox. So God himself has compared uh, Jacob, the children of Israel, to a wild ox. Now we're going to go over again into another uh, book in Torah here to go to Deuteronomy chapter 23 and verse 13. Deuteronomy 23 verse 13, it says, You will have an implement among your equipment, and let's see, did I get the, uh, I'm, on, I'm at 33. That was kind of like the wrong place. I mean, I was in 23, and I need to be at 33. I don't know what I said, but 33 is what I meant. Deuteronomy 33 in verse 13. Sorry about that. It says, Of Joseph, he said, Blessed is the eternal his... Uh, uh, blessed of the eternal is his land with the precious things of heaven and with the dew and with the deep uh, beneath with the precious fruits of the sun and the precious produce of the months with the best things of the ancient mountains and the precious things of the hills with the precious things of the earth in its fullness and with the favor of him who dwelt in the bush let the blessing come upon the head of Joseph and on the crown of him who was separate from his brothers. And it says of Joseph now then, verse 17, his glory is like a firstborn bull. And his horns are like the horns of the wild ox. Together with them, in other words, together with the glory of the firstborn bull and the horns that are like a wild ox, these different uh, attributes of the strength that God has given the children of Israel, he says, with them he shall push the peoples, in other words, the Gentiles, the nations, he will push the nations to the ends of the earth. Now, when we were in Isaiah, what did we read? Give ear, O earth. The whole world is to pay attention because any nation in the world, doesn't matter if it's Russia, doesn't matter if it's the United States of America, doesn't matter if it's China, doesn't matter how many nations of Edom or Persia or who gathers up against Israel. Because it's not by the strength of Israel, but it's by the strength of God that he carries out his word. So here is a prophecy that they are going to push the nations, the peoples, to the ends of the earth. And with what? Well, the horns of the wild ox. So who are these wild oxen we read about in Isaiah 34? I'm thinking you're seeing it right now. Genesis chapter 49. One more time, and I'll just do it quickly. Genesis chapter 49. In Genesis 49 and verse 8, it says, Judah, you are, you are he whom your brothers shall praise. Your hand shall be on the neck of your enemies. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies, it says. 
Well, but there is a place where God talks about they will cast their yoke off in the latter days at the very, very end. So <clears throat> at the very end, they will cast it off and there will be war as a result. And I think that's what we're going to be seeing soon. So now that I covered who the wild oxen were back in that prophecy of Isaiah 34, has a lot more meaning than when you understand. So we'll go back to Isaiah 34 then again. And indeed, the sword of heaven, verse 5, comes down on Edom on the people of my curse for judgment. Because the eternal has a sacrifice in Basra and a great slaughter in the land of Edom, and the wild oxen are going to come down with them, and young bulls and mighty bulls. You know what's a firstborn bull? That would be the young bull and the wild oxen. Because it's the day of the eternal's vengeance. Why? For the cause of Zion, verse 8. So that Israel can inherit their land. Let's go to Amos chapter 9. And continue now. Amos chapter 9 and verse 7. It says, are, not, are you not like the people of Ethiopia to me, O children of Israel, says the Eternal? Didn't I bring up Israel from the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from the Kaftor, and the Syrians from Ker? Behold, the eyes of the Eternal are on the sinful kingdom, and I will destroy it from the face of the earth. And yet I will not, or not utterly destroy the house of Jacob, says the Eternal. For surely I will command and I will sift the house of Israel among the nations as grain is sifted in a sieve. And yet not the smallest grain will fall to the ground. You know, sometimes I hear people talk, you know, because I practice Judaism. You know, people ask me, well, do you practice Judaism? Well, yes, I do, actually. Uh, of course I do. I practice Judaism. I practice biblical Judaism. I'm not really interested in rabbinical Judaism. I'm only interested in biblical Judaism. So, biblical Judaism, you know, it says God will keep track of every last grain that's sifted among the nations and wherever it is. Now, rabbinical Judaism will tell you in order to be a Jew, you have to convert to Judaism or you have to have your mother has to be. And they have all these rules. But God says, you know, they can be sifted and lost among the Gentiles for thousands of years. And I know who's who. Regardless if they qualify according to the rabbinical rules or not, God knows who is, who's a Jew and who's of the tribe of Ephraim and who's of the tribe of Zebulun after hundreds of generations of being lost among the Gentiles. God knows the offspring of who he's going to account as Israel and who he isn't. Not the smallest grain will be lost. And uh, it goes on, he says... All the sinners of my people shall die by the sword who say the calamity shall not overtake us. It won't confront us. On that day, I will raise up the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and I'll repair its damages. I will raise up the ruins, and I'll re rebuild it as in days of old, so that they may possess the remnant of Edom. So God's is saying that the Israel, Israel is going to possess the remnant of Edom. And notice what else it says. It's going to, the remnant of Eden, and, and all the Gentiles who are called by my name. All of them. Because that's what God's giving them to. Because he said that Israel would be a blessing to all nations. The whole world would be blessed through him. God is going to make it happen. It's not because Jews are so much better. <laughs> it's just because of God. It's just because of God. So then they may possess the remnant of Edom and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Eternal, who does this thing. Behold, the days are coming, says the Eternal, when a plowman will overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, uh, him who sows seed, 
The mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with it. And I will bring that back the captives of my people Israel. And they will build the waste cities and they will inhabit them. And they will plant vineyards and drink wine from them. And they will also make gardens and eat the fruit from the gardens. And I will plant them in their own land. And no longer shall they be pulled up. For the land I have given to them. That's who he gave it to, says the eternal. Now we'll go back to Micah. Micah chapter 5. A little bit of this tea here. Micah chapter 5. And verse 5 says, <clears throat> This one shall be shalom. And when the Assyrian comes into our land, and when he treads in our palaces, so then the Assyrian is going to come up into the land of Israel. Now, you know who the Assyrians are, right? Assyria was uh, the Persian Empire anciently. Today, it's uh, about half Edomites and about half uh, Persians, uh, Assyria. You know, Nineveh was an Assyrian city, right? It's a Babylonian city. Many times in history, Assyria and Babylon, Babylon have been interchangeable. They were the same kingdom for a long period of time. And other periods of time, but they were separate. Okay, so anyway... When the Assyrian comes into our land, Israel says. So get ready for the Assyrians to come into their land. And when he treads in our palaces. Okay, well, let's just hold our place there. I'm going to take you back and show you the ten nations. Now, people talk about the ten nations. Well, who are the ten nations, you know? These ten nations that it speaks about in the book of Revelation. I'll share with you who I think they are. And you can decide if you believe it or not. In Psalm 83... We'll come back. Psalm 83. I'll come back to Mike in a minute. I'll pick it up from verse 1 here. Do not keep silent, O God. Do not hold your peace. And do not be still, O God. For behold, your enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head. They have taken... It's interesting how the psalmist writes this. He, he, he takes the hate that's directed towards Israel and directs it towards God who's the one who said what Israel's role and place among the nations would be. And they have been hated for it. And so he, uh, the psalmist puts that hate towards God, actually, and even though the peoples try to aim it to Israel. But it's really aimed at God because it goes against the word of God. Your many enemies make a tumult. Those who hate you have lifted up their head, and they have taken crafty counsel against your people, and they have counseled together against your sheltered ones. And they have said, come, let us cut them off from being a nation so that the name of Israel would not even be remembered anymore. We don't even want people to remember there was ever a people named Israel. We'd kind of like to wipe them off of the face of the earth, wipe them off of the map so that you can't even remember us. Like Israel, where's that? I don't even see them on the map. Now, what nation is there that has said... We'd like to wipe them out from being a people so that they won't even be on the map anymore. I just want to ask you the question. Which nation has said we would like to eliminate Israel from being a people so that their name would be forgotten? Wipe them off of the face of the earth. Wipe them off of the map. Who said that recently? I mean, who said that like in the last week? I think it was one or two days before they had this quote-unquote agreement with Iran that, the, uh, uh, that Iran came out and said it again. How many times has, have the Iranian people said that they wanted to wipe Israel off? And what, not Iran, let's see, what were those people anciently? I'm trying to think. What was Iran anciently? Let's see here as I play my game of facetiousness. Oh, why? wait a second. That was Iran, wasn't it? Persia. The land of Edom and Persia. You get it? Do you see? Are you connecting the dots? That this is in the Bible prophesied thousands of years ago, and here we're watching it happen. I mean, are people awake by these things? Do they, does it stir you up? I just ask, if not, why not? 
That's what I ask. Okay, so that they wouldn't even be remembered anymore, they've consulted together with one consent, a confederacy in other words. Oh, well, that's what it says. They form a confederacy against you. So now who are these people that want to wipe out Israel from being in existence? Well, let's see. Uh, the tents of Edom. Well, we just read about Basra and what, they're going to be a possession. Well, maybe that's why. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. The secret to... Uh, Esau being blessed was to bless his brother. That's it. It's like, how easy can that be? Because I love my brother. Who would I rather bless than my own brother? I love my brother. My brother's so cool. My brother, God has, phew, man, I've got the best brother in the world. I mean, would it have been so hard to say? Then, then Esau could have been blessed all these years. See, that's what envy and jealousy does. It takes away the very thing that you want. Anyway, Edom is the first one mentioned. Also, Ishmael. Yeah, the Ishmaelites. Mm-hmm. Yep. So, uh, that would be Saudi Arabia. Be like Ishmael. Moab. Well, we read about Moab earlier, the Moabites, Right? The children of Lot, they're, they're gonna, their land's going back to Israel, whom God gave it to. We read that earlier in prophecies a couple of times already. Uh, let's see, the Hagarites, the children of Hagar. Gabal. Well, you know, in Gabal, that's Lebanon. I mean, you can go to Joshua 13 and verse 5. It talks about Gabal. That's Lebanon. So you got Moab, you got that's Jordan, and you know you got uh, Lebanon and Ammon, that's Jordan again. There's the and Amalek, well that's Gaza. You know the Philistines, the Amalekites, a lot of them in Iran too, a lot of Amalekites in Iran. Also the inhabitants of Tyre. And who do you, who's number 10? Who's the 10th? So, so far we're at nine nations. Who's the 10th nation listed? Oh, look at that. Assyria has joined with them. They have helped the children of Lot. Well, that's the Ammon and, and et cetera, Moab. So they helped the children of Lot. So Assyria. Assyria has said, oh, we well, should wipe them off of the face of the earth. They shouldn't even be a map. Here it is in this prophecy that these ten are going to have a confederacy against God. And why? What are they doing? Well, it tells you in verse 12, what do they want? What is it they're really after? It says in verse 12, they said, let us take for ourselves the pastures of God for a possession. We want the land. We want that pasture. We want the uh, territory for our possession. And so the psalmist writes, Oh God, make them like the whirling dust. As fire burns the woods and as the flame sets the mountains on fire, so pursue them with your tempest and frighten them with your storm. Fill their faces with shame so that they may seek your name. Let them be confounded and dismayed because you alone are the Most High and you reign over the earth, verse 18. So let's go back where we were now to Micah 5, okay? I'm sharing important prophecies with you. Micah 5, I hope that we're finding them interesting and a blessing. Micah chapter 5, picking it up in verse 5. When the Assyrian comes into our land. So we read about the Assyrian. So watch for the Assyrians to actually come into the territory of Israel. When they come into our land and when he treads in our palaces... What's going to happen? Then we will raise against him seven shepherds and eight princely men who will waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Now, sometimes people say, I'm just going to try to, hey, I'm going to kind of cover like two or three things at the same time here. So uh, I know a lot of people have got this idea in their head that uh, the Assyrians are modern day Germany. And that is one of the most cockamamie things I've ever heard. Nonetheless, a lot of people believe it. And I just want you to see in the Bible here, 
in God's own word, where God says the Assyrians will be at the time of the end when this confederacy of ten nations is coming against Israel. Okay? And he says that they're in the land of Nimrod, which would be right smack dab where they've always been. Because the Assyrians were the ones who raised up the city of Nimrod, right? It was one of the cities of Nimrod. So, I mean, named it after himself. So it's called the land of Nimrod. So we will raise seven shepherds and eight princely men who will waste with the sword the land of Assyria and the land of Nimrod at its entrances. Thus he shall deliver from the Assyrian when he comes into our land and when he treads within our borders. So watch for that to happen because when it does... God's going to have seven shepherds and eight princely men. Maybe they'll be generals, and they're going to orchestrate, uh, and God is going to make them remarkably strong. And people think, oh, yeah, well, then Israel's going to get whooped. Well, guess what? That's not what the Bible says. That might be what Israel haters say, but it's not what the Word of God says. The remnant of Jacob will be in the midst of many peoples like the dew from the eternal. Yeah, the remnant of Jacob will be among a lot of different people, scattered all over the place, like dew from God, like showers on the grass that tarry for no man, and they wait, uh, nor do they wait for the sons of men. And the remnant of Jacob will be among the Gentiles in the midst of many peoples. How? Like a lion among the beasts of the forest. You know what doesn't it say of Judah? Uh, it says Judah is a lion's whelp in the prophecies of Genesis 49. So Jacob is compared to the wild oxen, but also to a lion, like a lion's whelp, especially the tribe of Judah. The remnant of Jacob will be in the peoples like a lion among the beasts of the forest, like a young lion among the flocks of sheep, who if he passes through, he both treads down and tears in pieces, and nobody can deliver. Your hand will be lifted against your adversaries, and all your enemies will be cut off. And it shall be in that day, says the Eternal that I'll cut off your horses from your midst and destroy your chariots, and I'll cut off the cities of your land and throw down all your strongholds and cut off sorceries from your hand and all the soothsayers and all the carved images. And I'll destroy your cities, and I will execute vengeance in my anger on the nations that have not heard. Let's go over again just a little bit further to Micah. He continues the prophecy. I'll just pick it up again in chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, look at verse 12 here. In that day, they shall come to you from Assyria and from the fortified cities, from the fortress to the river. What river? What, what are you talking about? I just want to show you where Assyria is. It's not talking about Europe, friends. There's no mention of Europe here. It does talk about the river Euphrates. That is a location which is where Syria has always been. The Euphrates River right down there along the side between uh, what? Between like Iraq and Iran, right? That's the river. Remember God told Abraham, I'm going to give you this territory all the way to that river. That's what he's going to do. He's going to give it to Israel. But there are other people right now who are there. They're not going to want to move. You think that's all going to happen after Mashiach returns? I'm going to show you that what the Word of God says about that. Yeah, true. awesome things are going to happen when Mashiach returns. But awesome things are going to start happening before he returns. And that's, that's interesting. The truth will set you free. From sea to sea, from mountain to mountain, yet the land will be desolate because of those who dwell in it for the fruit of their deeds. Yeah. Yep, indeed. Verse 17, look what it says. They will lick the dust like a serpent, and they shall crawl from their holes like snakes of the earth. And they will be afraid of the eternal, our God, and they shall fear because of you. They will be afraid. Because of you, it says. Let's go back to Zephaniah chapter 2. Zephaniah chapter 2 and verse 8. It says, I have heard the reproach of Moab 
and the, re the revilings of the people of Ammon, with which they have reproached my people and made arrogant threats against their borders. Against their borders. I mean, the president of our own country wants them to divide up the land and give part of it to the Palestinians. And You know what I'm saying? They do make arrogant threats. If you don't do that, you know, I might just have to let the Security Council deal with this. And all the nations will be gathered together against Israel. I mean, how many different nations and leaders have made arrogant threats? <laughs> wow. Be careful. <laughs> the words we let come out of our mouth can, can be, you know, we can be judged by them. Well, anyway, uh, back, back to it. Zephaniah 2 and verse 8. <clears throat> Verse 9, therefore, as I live, says the eternal of hosts, the God of Israel, surely, surely Moab will be like Sodom, and the people of Ammon are going to be like Gomorrah, overrun with weeds and salt pits, a perpetual desolation, and the residue of my people shall plunder them. And the remnant of my people will possess them. And they will have for their pride because they have reproached and made arrogant threats against the people of the eternal of hosts. The eternal will be awesome to them and he will reduce to nothing all the gods of the earth. And also he says, you Ethiopians also. Verse 12, you're going to be slain by my sword. And verse 13, now look what he says, okay? He says in verse 13, God says, he will stretch out his hand against the north. Well, what's north? Damascus, you know, Lebanon. I mean, Assyria always seems to attack from the north. That's because they control Lebanon. You know, they, well, they like to come down through territories and people that are supportive of them. So... He will stretch his hand against the north and destroy Assyria and make Nineveh a desolation. Well, where's Nineveh? Well, it's the city of Nimrod. It's in Assyria. It's uh, the city of Assyria and the Nineveh, excuse me. That's a location. As dry as the wilderness, the herds are going to lie down in their midst and every beast of the nation, both the pelican and the, and the bittern, will lodge in the capitals of their pillars. Their voice will sing in the windows, desolation at the threshold, for he will lay bare the cedar work. Yeah, everybody's going to hiss when they see it. Let's go again to Jeremiah chapter 49. Sometimes people, maybe they just have never seen these prophecies. Uh, they don't consider I'm going to show you some more. Jeremiah chapter 49 and verse 1. Against the Ammonites. Thus says the Eternal. Has Israel no sons? Does, do the children of Israel have no heir? Well, oh no, they have sons. They have children. Well, then, why is Milcom inheriting Gad? Milcom was the ancient uh, god of the Ammonites and the Palestinians. So he's saying, well, why, is, why are these people inheriting Gad? That's what God says. And why are these people, why are his people dwelling in its cities? That would be the West Bank. That's the territory we're talking about here. Just so you know, the West Bank, right, where Hamas is right now. Hamas is in the West Bank, and God's like, why? <laughs> is it because the children of Israel don't have any sons? Is that why Hamas would be in the West Bank? Why are other people there, God asks. Therefore, behold, verse 2, the days are coming, says the Eternal, that I will cause to be heard an alarm of war in Rabbah, of the Ammonites, it will be a desolate mound, and her villages will be burned with fire, 
And then Israel will take possession of his inheritance, says the Eternal. Take possession of his inheritance? You mean like Shemitah? You mean I get my land back? It's redeemed? Yeah. But how does it happen? It's not where the people just say, hey, it's a Shemitah year. You know, we've taken good care of it for you, and now it's all fixed up and nice for you. You can have it now. Blessings. <laughs> it's not unfortunately happening that way. All right? Israel's going to take possession of his inheritance. And so he says, Well, O Heshbon, that would be the city of Ammon, for I is plundered. Cry, you daughters of Urbah, gird yourselves with sackcloth, remit and run to and fro by the walls. For Milcom, that's Ammon's God. You can read about that just, by the way, 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 33 talks about Milcom being Ammon's God and their king, their king God. Milcom will go into captivity with his priests and his princes together. Why do you glory in the valleys, your flowering valley, O backsliding daughter, who trusted in her treasury, saying, Who will come against me? Behold, I'll bring fear upon you, says the Eternal of hosts, from all those who are around you, and you will be driv driven out, everyone headlong, and no one will gather those who wander off. But afterward, I will bring back the captives of the people of Ammon. They have hope. God is going to bring them back and teach them and bless them at the right time. Now it goes on. Against Edom, thus says the Eternal of hosts, is wisdom no more found in Yemen? Well, I know it says Teman in our English Bibles, but the T is silent in the Hebrew, and that's Yemen. That's how that's pronounced, Yemen. Well, Yemen is like south of the southern part of Saudi Arabia. Down there is the little place called Yemen. Is wisdom no more in Yemen? Has counsel perished from the prudent? Has their wisdom vanished? Flee and turn back and dwell in the depths, O inhabitants of Dedan. That would be upper Saudi Arabia. That's where Dedan is. For I will bring the calamity of Esau upon him, the time that I will punish him. If grape gathers had come to you, wouldn't they have at least left a gleaning grapes? And if thieves would have come, wouldn't they destroy until they had enough? But I have made Esau bare and uncovered his secret places. And he shall not be able to hide himself. And his descendants are plundered, and his brethren and his neighbors. He is no more. Leave your fatherless children, and I will preserve them alive. And I will let your widows trust in me. And that's going to be their hope. They will learn to trust in God like Ruth did. And Naomi, right? For thus says the eternal, verse 12, Behold, those whose judgment was not to drink of the cup have assuredly drunk. And are you the one who will get all together go unpunished? You will not go unpunished, but you will surely drink. For I have sworn by myself, says the eternal, that Basra will become a desolation. Well, there it is again. Oh, it's the Edomites, remember? The children of Edom. Basra will become a desolation, a reproach, a waste, and a curse, and all its cities will be a perpetual wastes. I've heard a message from the Eternal, and an ambassador has been sent to the nations. So gather together and come against her, and rise up to battle, for indeed, I will make you small among the nations, despised among men. Your fierceness has deceived you in the pride of your heart, O you who dwell in the clefts of the rock. Yeah, I'd be in reference to Petra in that area, probably who hold the height of the hill. Those who make your nest as high as the eagle, I'll bring you down from there, says the Eternal. Edom also shall be an astonishment, and everybody who goes by it will be astonished and will hiss at all its plagues, as in the overthrow of Sodom and Gomorrah and their neighboring city, says the Eternal. And no one will abide there, nor shall the Son of Man dwell in it. Behold, he will come up like a lion from the flooding of Jordan against the habitation of the strong, but I will suddenly make him run away from her. And who is a chosen man that I may appoint over her? Who is like me? And who is going to arraign me, God says? And who is that shepherd who will withstand me? Who's going to stand against me when I decide to do this, God asks. Therefore, hear the counsel of the eternal that he's taken against Edom and his purpose that he purposed against the inhabitants of Yemen. Those are territories, exact names of cities which are still in existence today and countries and territories which are still in existence today. Surely the least of the flock will draw them out. Surely he will make their habitations desolate with them. And the earth shakes at the noise of their fall. And the cry of the noise is heard at the Red Sea. That's a territory. Behold, 
He will come up and fly like an eagle and spread his wings over Basra. And the heart of the mighty men of Edom in that day will be like the heart of a woman in birth pangs. Now he goes on against Damascus. Well, we read about that Damascus uh, prophecy earlier. Remember, it was going to cease to even be a city in one day. It would fall in one day against Damascus. That's, of course, you know, up in the northern, uh, above the northern border of Israel, t today's border. Hamath and Arafat are ashamed for they have heard bad news and they're faint-hearted. There's trouble on the sea and it can't be quiet. Damascus has grown feeble and she turns to flee and her fear has seized her. Anguish and sorrows have taken her like a woman in labor. Why is the city of praise not deserted? The city of my joy. Therefore... Her young men shall fall in her streets, and all the men of war shall be cut off in that day, says the Eternal of hosts. And I will kindle a fire in the wall of Damascus, and it will consume the palaces of Ben-Hadad. Against Kedar, verse 28, that would be upper Saudi Arabia, lower uh, Iraq. Against Kedar and against the kingdoms of Hazor, which Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, will strike. So he has some things there. Verse 34, against Elam. Now, this is interesting. I hope you're paying attention now in verse 34. The word of the eternal came to Jeremiah the prophet against Elam. You know where Elam is? It's present day Iran. That is very specific. It has always referred to Iran. It still refers to Iran today. Will refer to Iran tomorrow. Did the day before yesterday and did last week and did a thousand years ago. Elam is Iran. Behold, I will break the pride of Iran, the foremost of their might. You know what the foremost of Iran's might is today? It's the nuclear facilities that they got going. It's the foremost of their might. And they got these deep tunnels that go deep, deep into the heart of the earth to try to protect them. Of course, the Russians have just uh, agreed to sell them the S-300 system and more anti-battery systems and things to try to defend it. That is the foremost of their power and their pride. The foremost of their might. But God says, against Elam, I will bring the four winds from the four quarters of heaven, and I will scatter them to all those winds, and there will be no nations where the outcasts of Iran will not go. Remember, we read about Iran, Assyria, Assyria, Iran, Elam, it's all the same. We read about it in Psalm 83. We read about it in Isaiah. We read about it, and we're reading about it in Jeremiah. I will break the bow. That's your armament of war, right? I mean, that is what it's, you understand when it's a break the bow. It's not talking about, you know, knocking down your uh, cherry tree. It's talking about your military might, the foremost of their might. Their military power is in their nuclear facilities. Against the Lamb, I'll bring the four winds, and I'll scatter them towards all those winds, and there will be no nations where they won't go, where I will cause Elam to, be dis Elam to be dismayed before their enemies and before those who seek their life, and I will bring disaster upon them. My fierce anger, says the Eternal, and I will send the sword after them until I've consumed them. And I will set my throne in Iran, or Elam, and I will destroy from uh, there the king and the princes, says the eternal. But it'll come to pass in the latter days, I'll bring back the captives of Elam. Well, for them, since this stuff happens right before the beginning of the millennium, the latter days refers to the end of the millennium. So that's, I mean, that's, uh, that's when that will happen. So, I mean, <laughs> wow, we've covered... We've covered a lot of stuff. Now, I, I have a lot more here, uh, a lot more that I'd like to share with you. Where are we in our time? It's been, okay, so let me just kind of start to wrap it up then. We're going to go back and wrap it up. I'll come back with another message because uh, I, I have uh, some more information I wanted to share more specifically territorially. Where is modern day uh, uh, you know, where's the beast power? I wanted to specifically address that. Where's the beast power? Where are the ten nations? Uh, you know, where is Babylon? Where is Babylon in the Bible? And, and I will show you that 
because you don't have to try to figure and guess and think, well, maybe it's in Germany and the, all this kind of stuff. And you don't have to be a Bible guesser. You can just read the Bible and it'll tell you right exactly where it is. Not just where it was, where it is. Historically, where it will be when Messiah returns in the latter days. Where they will be located. Not where they were. So some people try to say, yeah, I know that's where they were, but Babylon isn't there anymore. Well, I'm talking about prophecies in the Bible that will show you where they are, not where they were, and where they will be when Messiah returns. And guess what? It's right back where they were. And I will show you many, many, many places in the Bible that make that abundantly clear. It changes the whole Christian way of thinking, believe me, when it comes to prophecy, where they think Babylon is. Some people think Babylon's the United States of America, actually. Some people, most people think Babylon is in Europe somewhere, you know, it's, the, it's, it's Germany, or it's the Pope, or, you know, hey, <laughs> those are Bible guessers. I'm sorry, it's just, it's just people trying to figure it out, you know. But let's look and see where the Bible shows those places as being. That would be interesting, wouldn't it? I don't have time to do that today. Today I'd like to finish up with what I'm on. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah. Uh, I said, uh, yeah, yeah, that's right. It is Zechariah. I was almost going to go to Zephaniah. Zechariah chapter 12. It says, the burden of the eternal against Israel. Thus says the eternal who stretches out the heavens, verse 1, lays the foundation of the earth and forms the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of drunkenness to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah and against Jerusalem. Some actually translate that as a cup of drunkenness. They translate that as cup of poison. All who drink it will die, in other words. It will destroy you, not just make you drunk, tipsy, maybe, woo No. It's destructive. It will kill you. So a drunken cup or a poisonous cup to all the surrounding peoples when they lay siege against Judah, it's like drinking a cup of poison. And it will happen in that day that I will make Jerusalem a very heavy stone for all people. And all who would heave it away will surely be cut in pieces. All. Though all the nations of the earth are gathered against it. It doesn't matter how many nations there are. In that day, says the Eternal, I will strike every horse with confusion and its rider with madness. And I will open my eyes on the house of Judah and I will strike every horse of the peoples with blindness. And their governors of Judah will say in their heart, the inhabitants of Jerusalem are my strength. The Lord of hosts is their, uh, you know, their God. They're all praying for me. Our own people, you know, this, uh, they're going to feel uh, very patriotic for Israel. And they're going to say, we're the people of God. You know, they're going to kind of rally up. And that day I will make the governors of Judah, verse 6, like a fire pan in the wood pile and like a fiery torch in the sheaves, and they will devour all the surrounding peoples on the right hand and on the left hand. That's what's going to happen when the nations gather against Judah. Little tough Judah, God's, they're going to be tough because God's going to make them tough. Not because they're tough on their own. This is what God is going to do. But Jerusalem will be inhabited again in her own place, Jerusalem. Right where she's always been. The eternal will save the tents of Judah first. So that the glory of the house of David, in other words the outlying areas around Jerusalem will be saved first. So that the house of David in Jerusalem will not exceed it, right? So that the house of David and the glory of the inhabitants of Jerusalem will not become greater than that of Judah and the surrounding areas. And that day the eternal will defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. The one who is feeble among the inhabitants of Jerusalem in that day is going to be like David. And David, the house of David, is going to be like God, like 
the angel of the eternal before them. You know, like when uh, Mo God said to Moshe, he said, I will make you like God to Pharaoh. So it's going to be, wow, <laughs> God is really using you guys. And it is going to be awesome. And it will be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that came against Jerusalem. You do not want God seeking to destroy you. That is not good. And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication when they look upon me whom they've pierced. And they will have a spirit of grace over them. And they will come to see the grace of the eternal. Something that the Christian community has seen for a long time, how gracious God is. And all the house of Israel are going to have this spirit of grace poured upon them as well. And they will look upon the, on the Messiah whom they have pierced. And we'll mourn, you know, back in the Talmud. I know that they've had later uh, rabbinical thinking has tried to reinterpret this, but back in the days of the Talmud, they considered this a messianic prophecy. You can read about it in the Talmud. It's a messianic prophecy. That's what, they, that's what the Jews thought it was, and they're correct. They will look upon whom whom they have pierced as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves over a firstborn. Oh, they, oh, man, I can't believe it. How could we have done? Oh, in that day shall be a great morning in Jerusalem, like the morning of Hadad Ramon in the plain of Megiddo, like when they were mourning over righteous Josiah when he died in battle. And the land will mourn every family by itself, the family of the house of David by itself, and their wives by themselves. The house of Nathan, the prophet who served David, by itself and their wives by the by the south the house of levi by itself their wives by themselves the family of shemai by itself their wives and each individual will be mourning and that day i'll open up a fountain now i just want to point out here that this is zechariah 12 we're reading from okay because when Messiah comes back, that happens in Zechariah chapter 14. I just want to clarify that so everybody's really clear on this. So chapter 12 is what happens in the prelude to Messiah's coming. Before Messiah comes, in the prelude. So what's going to be happening during the tribulation and the pre-tribulation era? Well, we've been reading about it. These prophecies that we've been reading about are the things that lead up to Messiah's return, not things that take place after his return. Of course, after his return, of course, it only gets better. Of course. So, you know, we come down uh, in chapter 14. Behold, the day of the eternal is coming because it isn't here yet. And it wasn't here in chapter 12 either. And it wasn't in 13. But it is coming. And they're talking about it. It's coming. So it means it hadn't come yet. Chapter 14. And your spoil will be divided in your midst. When they come and they surround Jerusalem, what this is saying, and the spoils divided in the midst, understand what it's saying. It's like this. is If you broke into somebody's house, you know, a couple of thieves broke into somebody's house, they're so bold, they're dividing up the spoil. Okay, here's, you get that watch. Okay, I'll take this jewelry. Oh, here's a gun. That's for you. And they're actually dividing it up right in the midst of Jerusalem. They're so confident in themselves that they're trying to divide up how they're going to allocate what, they, what their, their booty, that they're doing it right in the midst of the land. They're not even going out of the country back to their own land to, to decide. That's how bold they are. Right in the midst, dividing the spoil in the midst, for I will gather all nations. So in case you want to know who's going to be involved, all nations. All nations to battle against Jerusalem. So when you hear threats about, well, we might just turn the security council against you, uh, take it seriously. Take it seriously. For I will gather all the nations against Jerusalem. The city will be taken, the houses rifled, and the women ravished. Half of the city will go into captivity. But the remnant of the people shall not be cut off from the city. And then, it says then. Now, I understand the word then. 
It's like after that happens, at that point, while they're right there in the midst of the city dividing the spoil, then the eternal will go forth and fight against those nations as he fights in the day of battle. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives. So all this other stuff that we've been talking about has been fantastic. God's going to make the weak, and, uh, weak man in, in Jerusalem like David. And they are going to be, you know, the wild ox are going to do this and that. That's all before Messiah returns. And it's going to culminate, finally, half the city has fallen, but they've been able to keep half of it, and they're fighting right there, still doing battle. Then the Eternal will step in. And in that day, his feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives will be split in two from the east to the west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain will move toward the north. Half of the mountains will move toward the south. And you will flee through my mountain valley. The mountain valley will reach to Azal. Yes, you will flee as you fled from the earthquake in the days of Uzziah, king of Judah. Thus the eternal my God will come and all the saints with you. Well, you know, in the Bible, the word saints refers to the house of Israel. Now, later on in the Brit Hadashah, the New Testament, the saints also includes the Christian community because they're grafted into the tree that is Israel. And they're called saints as well. And the saints have this special privilege. There are going to be a lot of converted saints, and they're going to be those who, who are saints by right, who are being converted <laughs> Uh, Jews, in other words, or Zebulun, or ha whatever, they are going to come. God is going to bring them together, and they are going to do this battle with him at their side, with him leading. And it will come to pass in that, that, in that day that there will be no light. The lights will diminish. And it will be one day which is known to the eternal, neither day nor night, but at evening time it will happen that it will be light. And in that day it will be the living waters will flow from Jerusalem. Eternal will be king over all the earth. The eternal is one, Yahweh Echad in his name, one. And the land will be turned into the plain from Geba to Ramon, south of Jerusalem. Jerusalem will be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate to the corner gate, from the tower of Hanil to the king's wine presses. And the people will dwell in it and no longer will be there utter destruction, but Jerusalem will be safely inhabited. And this is the plague that the Eternal will strike all the people who fought, historically, past tense now, fought against Jerusalem. All those, the time when it was talking about all the fighting, that was before Messiah returned. And all the, and Israel will do valiantly. But then when Messiah comes and finally puts an end to it all, the flesh will dissolve while they still stand on their feet and their eyes are going to dissolve in their sockets and their tongue is going to dissolve in their mouth. And it will come to pass in that day that a great panic from the eternal will be among them and everyone will seize the hand of his neighbor and raise the hand against his neighbor. And Judah also will fight at Jerusalem right up until the end. Right up until the end. Well, the reason they're fighting at Jerusalem is because the world is trying to take Jerusalem away from them. And God's saying, it's a Shemitah time, or maybe, and maybe it won't be Shemitah year at that time. I'm not saying, but I'm saying it's time for the land to go back. It's time for the principle of Jubilee to begin to take place here. And the wealth of the surrounding nations will be gathered together, their gold, their silver, and apparel in great abundance. Such also will be the plague on the horse and on the mule and the camel and the donkey and on all cattle that will be in those camps. And it will come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem will go from year to year and begin to keep those Jewish feasts, as the world calls them. They will keep the festival of Sukkot. The Egyptians will keep the festival of Sukkot. The Gentiles will keep the festival of Sukkot. And if the Gentiles don't learn to start keeping the festival of Sukkot, God's not going to give them any rain. Is Judaism going to be dead? <laughs> no, obviously not. That day will be holiness to the eternal. I hope that this teaching has been enlightening for you. I hope that it will be a blessing for you so that you can help kind of navigate the waters of prophecy as you see things happening. 
And if it has been a blessing to you, then I hope you will consider what the Apostle Paul said in Galatians 6.6, 6, that, uh, that you will partner with us in this ministry. Let him who hears the word share in all good things with those who teach so that we can share the same good word with others and uh, spread the word to as many people as we possibly can. God be with you.